to Professor Ananish Chowdhury. Uh, Ananish is a Professor of Experimental Economics at the University of Auckland. He serves as a Chair of the Department of Economics uh, um, between 2013 and 2019. He's also Founder and Director of Decide, the University of Auckland's Business Making Lab. He's ranked amongst one of the top 10% of authors in economics across the world, according to the Research Papers in Economics and Social Science Research Network databases. Um, Ananish is one of the founding members of the Plan B group. Uh, welcome, Ananish. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank turn it over to you. you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And uh, it's been a fascinating few hours for all of us, I think. So I'm going to try and provide a slightly different perspective on this topic by talking about decision making in a pandemic. So I'm going to start my slideshow. Okay, Mark, I hope you can see my slides. I'm going to turn off the presenter view. Yes, we can see that. Okay, and excellent. All right. It. Okay, so um, as uh, Grant was talking about it uh, right now, uh, just a little while ago, I think it's fair to say that this is the current view of the COVID-19 pandemic in New Zealand that we are surrounded by this massive disease. However, I think um, a number of the experts have talked about the actual risk, and um, this is from coronavirus, our world in data. So if you live anywhere in the world, except for those red countries, India, United States, Brazil, maybe Russia, the situation isn't as dire as it's being made out to be. And the reason why the situation is so dire in those countries has some particular reasons. Some of them have been alluded to in terms of mismanagement, etc. So by and large, the view uh, or the culture of fear that's been created is somewhat misplaced. Okay, so a large part of decision making in a pandemic or in scenarios like recessions is dealing with uncertainty. As humans, we crave certainty and we are actually not very good at dealing with events that are uncertain because we feel an acute loss of control. And this in turn makes us vulnerable to some systematic errors of judgment that compound the problem. So what kinds of errors? So I'm gonna talk about three themes or three biases. The first of these is often called the distinction between system one and system two thinking. So when confronted with a problem, we often tend to rely on our gut feelings. The second bias is something that's called confirmation bias. And the third one, sorry, and the third one is a difficulty with probabilistic thinking. So many of these are connected. So I've written quite a bit on this topic. Uh, and uh, so some, some listeners maybe may have heard this argument before, but nevertheless, I'll go through it. In the immediate aftermath of September 11, 2001, many Americans decided that flying was too risky and they chose to drive. In the following 12 months, an additional 1,500 people lost their lives on the road as they drove to their destination. This is more than the total number of passengers who died on the four planes, excluding deaths that happened, say, in the World Trade Center. Now, the reason we tend to do this is because we tend to focus excessively on identified lives, the loss of lives right in front of us. And we are afraid of losing a large number of lives in a short period. So Jay Bhattacharya this morning mentioned aspects of this. But in doing so, 
we miss out on the loss of what is often called statistical lives. But the point here is that these are lives versus lives. The lives lost that you can see right in front of your eyes and the lives lost in the background diffuse that is not reported as much. Again, Jay Bhattacharya pointed out, but very briefly, uh, what kinds of um, lives are we losing other than COVID? So the answers would be increase in mortalities due to other diseases. Sunetra Gupta talked about the social compact between developed and developing countries. Evidence suggests that about 80 million children have not been vaccinated in developing countries. And this has caused a surge in diphtheria, measles, cholera, and these diseases will again start to spread all around. Jay Bhattacharya talked about lowered life expectancy from higher unemployment. We have had postponed doctor visits, screening and surgeries. And so in aggregate, even though these are larger, they don't loom as large in our collective psyche. And, and I think Jay Bhattacharya also re referred to this psychological phenomenon. I'm going to not go there right now, but I'm happy to address this if there are any questions. So what is system one and system two thinking? So system one is kind of our automatic gut reaction. It's intuitive. It jumps into action immediately once we receive a piece of information. System two, on the other hand, is deliberative, thoughtful, reflective, but it takes time to engage. So one way to think about this is system one is the elephant. As soon as you get a piece of information, the elephant larches into action. System two, on the other hand, is more like the rider. The rider can turn the elephant around, but it is not easy. It takes a huge amount of effort once the elephant has set down a particular path. So let me give you a couple of examples. So now look at this for a minute. Uh, suppose I asked you, and many of you have seen this before. Suppose I asked you that looking between those arrows, if I asked you to look at these two line segments, A and B, between the arrows, and I asked you, which one do you think is larger? And if you look at it, I'm sure you would agree with this, even if you've seen this before, it seems A is larger, and in, in many, many studies, a large majority of people will say that the line segment A between those arrows is larger. Now, this is false, and the reason it's false is because of this. The two line segments are the exact same length. I'll tell you in a minute why I'm talking about this. Let's look at a next example. This is a study by Solomon Ash on what's called conformity. And he was interested in trying to understand why do so many people conform to a particular idea, even if the idea is not correct. So the question here is if you look at the red line on the left, then which of the three lines, A, B, or C on the right, are the same length as the red line? This is slightly more difficult, but if you look at this long enough, you will realize after a while that the red line is the same length as the C line. Now, why is this interesting? Because there are enormous amount of studies that have shown that if for some reason, a whole bunch of people claimed that the red line was the same length as the B line or the A line, a large number of people would willingly go along with that view. So those of you who are interested and who are listening, if you are not convinced, then uh, you go on YouTube. Some of you are already on there. Uh, look for a game, a, a study called, not a study, a show called National Geographic's Brain Games. And under brain games, just search for brain games conformity, and you will see this in action. 
this person, Jason Silva, he's going to have a whole bunch of people come in and they'll all say that the red line is the same length as the B line. And then you will see unsuspecting study participants will all line up with that view. Now, the reason why this is interesting or applicable here is that in some cases then, having seen something and come to believe that this is correct, it actually becomes very difficult to unsee it. So once you become convinced of the truth of a particular position, once the elephant has launched into action, it's actually not that easy to turn it around, which is what you are seeing in the current scenario. And the this is where the second bias kicks in, that once you are convinced that COVID-19 is a major threat, at that point, you are only paying attention to the information that confirms your presupposition. You are going to actively disregard any information that doesn't line up with your already formed view that, oh my goodness, this is a major threat. So it is psychologically painful to change our minds. It can happen, but it happens with difficulty and possibly after overwhelming evidence has been brought into existence. So here's an example, um, because it's been a longish day, uh, maybe they'll find this funny. So this is Stephen Colbert. He is talking about George W. Bush at the White House Correspondence Dinner 2006. So instead of playing the clip, I'll just read it out. So here's what Colbert said. He said, we, meaning George W. Bush, we are not that different. He and I, we both get it. Guys like us, we are not some brainiac or nerd patrol. We are not members of the fact anista. We go straight from the gut. That is where the truth lies, right down here in the gut. Do you know that there are more nerve endings in your gut than in your head? You can look it up. Now, I know some of you will say that I did look it up and that is not true. That's because you looked it up in a book. Next time, look it up in your gut. I did. My gut tells me that's how our nervous system works. So once your gut feelings have convinced you of a particular position, it's actually not very easy to change your mind. So that's what we see here, right? So when we, this whole thing first started, you had this banner headline saying the case fatality ratio is 3%. And then our system once went into overdrive. We said, oh my goodness, lockdown. We got to combat this major pandemic. But if you actually paused a little and engaged your system too, you could have found out some of the following fairly quickly. The first is that uh, your system would have said, well, okay, uh, but is 3% high or low? It turns out that the case fatality ratio for Ebola is about 50%, MARS 35%, SARS 9 to 10%. So 3% doesn't seem very high. And then as has been pointed out repeatedly today, the case fatality ratio doesn't really mean all that much. What you want to know is the infection fatality ratio, but you don't know that unless you have tested extensively, right? But if you didn't take this step back and engage in this kind of deliberative thinking, then of course you are now locked into this entire story that this is a major threat that we need to combat. So then lockdowns, as has been pointed out, uh, weak if any correlation between policy stringency and cases. But once again, the narrative became that it was either lockdown or let it rip. There was little consideration along the way that there's a whole continuum in between with associated costs and benefits at each of those levels. I'm not going to go too much into this, but New Zealand is a high trust society. People here follow instructions and they can be relied upon to do the right things, such as self-isolation when called upon to do so. Which brings me to the kind of 
the next part of my talk, which is these questions. Should we keep our borders closed? Should we have yet another lockdown? Should people have to pay for quarantine? These are all, as I'll argue in a minute, they're all related questions. And I want to address one thing Sunetra Gupta said. She said that we have violated this contract between developed countries and developing countries. I think Jay Bhattacharya talked about this as well. But in New Zealand, forget developing countries. We violated a basic contract between the government and our own citizens. All of a sudden, we were telling our citizens that if you want to have the privilege of coming back to your own homeland, you are now looking at paying an additional three to six thousand dollars. So it wasn't even that we hunkered down between our own borders and our own nationalities. Even our own nationalities became pariahs in New Zealand. Okay, so quote and Dimas, where are we going? Uh, I think. The common theme to those questions is a lack of understanding of small probabilities. Beyond the point, and this has been pointed out, I think by David Katz, that the risk from COVID-19 is actually fairly small. And so beyond the point, it's really not worrying about low probability events. But of course, somewhere along the way, our story had morphed from flatten the curve to elimination. And as has been pointed out, elimination is not a feasible goal. We thought measles had been eliminated. We had an outbreak in Auckland in 2019. It's a global world. As long as people and goods travel, so will diseases, unless you stay hunkered down behind closed borders for the rest of your existence. If and when a vaccine arrives, it won't arrive very soon, as we found out. Not only do we need all Kiwis to get vaccinated, we really need every single citizen of the world to get vaccinated. So now we have created this vast bureaucracy and incurred these huge costs to deter a relatively low probability event. And what a lot of people aren't get going getting, I think, is that getting a probability down from one in 100 to one in 100, sorry, one in 10 to one in 100 may not be very difficult, but going down to one in a thousand or even lower becomes prohibitively expensive. We cannot get this probability down to zero and we do not need to, as I said, current threat is of COVID is less than getting into a car accident. So this trade-off between further risk minimization and incurring huge social and economic costs, it's not being appreciated, partly because now that we have staked our reputation on this elimination story, going back is very difficult. We have devoted so much time, effort, and energy into the country, the team of 5 million that could eliminate this disease, it's a bit difficult to turn back. So now it's more about ego and hubris than evidence-based decision making. I'm going to end by talking a little bit about something slightly different. This is work that we have done under a Morrison grant, and I want to point this out to people. So, so there has been this narrative that um, this COVID response is a liberal conservative thing. Liberals are pro-lockdown, conservatives are not, and that is incorrect. I'll tell you in a minute, and I'll explain why this sort of narrative that this is a major pandemic took hold so quickly. So this unidimensional view of politics between liberals and conservatives is at least incomplete, if not incorrect. And uh, in a recent paper, we provide an evolutionary argument as to how some of us are liberal, some conservative, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't know if David Seymour is listening, but uh, he might appreciate the next parts. There are economic conservatives and there are economic liberals. And there are social conservatives and there are social liberals. These are different types of people. Economic liberals, so 
when we talk about liberals, these are the kinds of people we sort of think about. These are people who believe in equality, in, in redistribution and things along those lines. These are people who believe in cooperation, egalitarianism, and these people essentially viewed social physical distancing as a cooperative activity. They were strongly in favor of lockdowns, including military involvement. This is based on a very large study we carried out in England. Social conservatives, on the other hand, they tend to be sort of group conformist, group minded, and they are threat or what's called pathogen sensitive. So social conservatives who are sort of the people who think of as conservatives, they perceive these lockdowns also as mitigating that pathogen threat and were also supportive of strict lockdowns, including military involvement. And so you got a striking concordance in views of two very disparate groups of people who supported lockdowns for totally different reasons. But once the narrative got hold, turning that elephant around has been very, very difficult. Though I think we are beginning to make slight headway recently. Okay. So in the words of uh, Dennis Miller from Saturday Night Live, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, a shameless plug, I just put that, sorry, that should be onanishchowdhury.com. I put that there because in case you want my slides, those slides are available on my website. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Ananish. Um, right, we've got a couple of questions. Um, I think people will be a little bit surprised to see uh, the extent to which psychology had um, come into economics, which in my view is a good thing. Um, so uh, <clears throat> given your explanation for why people are thinking uh, one way or the other, a support or not, um, I mean, what, what does it take to, to change that narrative, to turn it around? Uh, and how long would it take? So I don't have a good answer to this question. Um, as we discussed earlier, uh, it probably doesn't make a lot of sense to tell people that you know they are wrong or they don't understand. I think what it takes is a very reasoned uh, approach. And you know this, I've talked about my favorite movie, 12 Angry Men, where uh, Henry Fonda tries to convince 11 other jurors by not so much telling them they're wrong, but by simply asking questions like, what do you think of this? You know, is this possible? You know, what about the costs? You know, is this a sustainable solution, lockdown after lockdown? And as you know, in order to do this, you really need to have kind of a level playing field where dissenting views are given a voice. That has been difficult, I think, as a lot of yeah. people have realized. Um, but I think the key has been, or key was, especially for someone like Simon, uh, perseverance, saying this repeatedly and um, having a thick skin without, you know, being able to <laughs> bear the arrows of, of hatred and kind of repeating the story by saying, look, you know, here is what the science says, you know, look at what the infection fatality ratio really is and things along those lines. But it's not, it's been difficult. Hmm. Um, so another question, uh, right on economics. Uh, do you think people have appreciated the, the economic impact? It hasn't happened yet uh, or, or not decidedly or not in any way that's kind of featuring everybody's daily lives. Um, uh, when might that happen? And can you probably put some uh, description around what that might be like, what, uh, a recession or depression even? Do you think it's likely and what it'll be yeah, so like? So two answers to that. So one, I think, I think Jay Bhattacharya presented an extremely eloquent answer to that question when he talked about uh, what a $3,000 per person reduction in income means, mm. what it means for life expectancy. Uh, let me just say two things here. One is, and Jay Bhattacharya alluded to this, one is um, this psychological tendency that we sometimes call loss aversion. And what loss aversion says is that I want to avoid a small certain loss now 
even if that means a much larger expected loss <clears throat> down the road because that larger expected loss doesn't figure as much on our psyche for some reason. And here's the point. The point is that when unemployment gets to 10, 12, 15%, that can be catastrophic. That's when you get gated communities. That's when you have, you know, confrontations between police and communities, right? Um, you really don't want to go there, but it's not that it's not that surprising because I think we would be foolish to think that New Zealand will never get there. Greece did, Portugal did, Ireland did, Spain did in the middle of the global financial crisis. Some of these countries went to unemployment levels of, of 20, 25%, and the economic cost of that is massive. And not to mention the social cost of isolation, kids not going to school and things along those lines. But communities can very quickly fall apart and the falling apart part can happen quickly, but the rebuilding part may take a very long time. And recently um, somebody asked me, you know, all this money we are borrowing, who are we borrowing it from? And I said, well, really we are borrowing Borrowing it from ourselves, but if all the governments in the world taken together, the money they have borrowed, if one fine day, let's say New Zealand, if one fine day, all our creditors came and asked for their money back, we won't be able to repay them. The only reason this system works is because the creditors trust that we will not default. And therefore they're willing to hang on to their borrowing. So this is like an interest only mortgage as long as you keep paying the interest or a minimum payment on your credit card, you're okay. But for some reason, if the trust breaks down, then it can be catastrophic because then you have something called capital flight where no one wants to hold your loan anymore. That's when your currency goes into a complete tail tailspin. Inflation starts to rise. And again, I'm hoping we won't get there but when your government borrowing starts to approach 50% of your GDP or more, the potential for that happening is, is it's there. I mean, the probability starts to increase quite rapidly. Hmm. Um, so predictions would be a bit of a mug's game, <laughs> but um, it would be hard to imagine um, that we are, that we're not going to have some sort of dip, economic dip. Uh, and, oh, we're certainly going to have a massive economic dip. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. by, the end of, uh, by the end of this year, early next year, we're going to have a very massive economic dip. I mean, we have shut down, essentially, we have shut down our biggest export industry, tourism, and our fifth biggest industry, which is education. Right? Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm probably way out of time, but there's only so much dairy and meat and lumber you can sell because these are primary products and there's a finite ceiling on their consumption. As countries get richer, they don't necessarily start eating a lot more meat, but they do start to travel a lot more. So in economic sparlands, when income levels rise, your tourism dollars will bring you a bigger bang for your buck than your dairy dollars. So I don't see how this is a sustainable scenario where we shut down our biggest export industry. Uh, is that recoverable? Uh, by, by that I mean, um, can we avert some of it by, um, by changing soon, by changing before the end of the year, um, changing some policies that be at the border uh, or anything like that? I mean, or is this actually um, not dependent on our on what we do, but actually internationally, are, are we going to be influenced by the international recession? Well, there are two issues. We are a very small country in the middle of the South Pacific, so obviously we are very much at the mercy of sort of international, large international countries. But, but in my view, the answer is reasonably clear. We open the borders. We have. I. I would. Agree, I would probably say. I. I. I'm no grant. Probably won't agree. But maybe we should be willing to have contact tracing on our cell phones so that everybody could be tracked. 
give up that privacy. Maybe we should be willing to give up on rugby games for now, but open the border, maybe go to level two or something similar, which is what the European countries are doing. Uh, I personally, I'm a big sports fan, but mm -hmm. I'm happy to have open borders and not go to games. Uh, All right. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank I think you. covered most of the questions that came up. Thank you, Ananesh.